Zayla Camacho. I'm the Archivist and Special Collections Librarian here at Cal State LA. This is, exhibit is about healthcare professionals and how they're experiencing COVID-19 and also the artwork that comes out from some of the healthcare professionals um, such as Dr. Grace Ferris. My name's Grace Ferris. I'm a a physician. I work as a hospitalist at the University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School. And I've been here since July 2020. Prior to that, I was working as the chief of hospital medicine at Mount Sinai West, um, which is a hospital in Midtown Manhattan in New York City. So you were um, like in the in the center of it all right before that. Yeah. Yeah. It, we started seeing our first COVID patients at the beginning of March, 2020. Yeah. That was during the first surge. So it started off uh, with internal medicine was seeing these patients. And then slowly the whole hospital started seeing those patients. We had orthopedic surgeons and urologists and radiologists um, seeing COVID patients uh, during that first surge in New York city. How did you get uh, interested to begin your work in the medical field, did you have an experience earlier in life or did you just kind of fall into it? How did that all happen? Um, well, I started volunteering when I was 14 at the hospital where I work now. So I grew up in Austin and I thought that the hospital microcosm of kind of, of the regular uh, world was very interesting. I like how there's um, just a lot of people working towards kind of like one goal of, um, you know, getting patients into the hospital, trying to um, fix things or um, make things better. And, and so I was um, really interested in that world um, starting in high school. And so then I ended up uh, going to medical school and um, I didn't know that there was a job where you could just work in the hospital when I started medical school and I thought I might do OBGYN, but then I had a lot of like great mentors in hospital medicine. So now my job is mostly um, seeing patients who would get admitted for pneumonia or kidney problem or heart problem, um, infections. You see a lot of just different interesting um, issues. Some things are really serious. Sometimes people are um, you know, towards the end of life. And sometimes people get better and they're very young and they just had a serious infection. And so before COVID-19, we saw a lot of different pneumonias. And so then when COVID-19 came, it was, um, you know, this very specific type of pneumonia, but still everything else, because it's not like anything else really stops. Can you tell us about a challenging time you've experienced during this last year? And during the pandemic? I think during the New York surge, you know, that started at, in early March. We were seeing our first patients around the Ides of March. My mother-in-law said, you know, I think I should take the kids up. She lived outside of New York City. Um, and I was like, I, I'm not sure that's necessary. And she said, no, I think they're going to close the schools. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and then they did close the schools. And so my mother-in-law took my at then uh, a four-year-old and eight-year-old um, to Connecticut. And then for the next two months, it was just very busy. Um, and so they stayed in Connecticut and we didn't see them. We um, talked to them on the phone to FaceTime. So that was, that was definitely the hardest part. And I'm not sure that it was really, while it was happening, it didn't feel so hard. But then when they came back, I felt very sad that like this, there's kind of, there, there had been this huge gap and especially with the four-year-old, you know, that, that time when they're little, it just goes by so quickly. So that was hard. I think now having gone through like several surges and been in New York and then in Texas, um, you know, the, the patients started, well, the Texas surge was more in July. And then when I started in August, um, we were still seeing a lot of COVID patients and I hadn't really recognized that the first time around, like that part of the um, hard part about seeing these patients is that, well, the, the, you know, they can be any age, so they're young or old. And normally if you had a patient who was really short of breath, you would have something to give them. Um, you might give them like um, something for anxiety or something to help with pain that also kind of helps with that shortness of breath. And with these patients, I felt like um, really trying to avoid them getting worse or needing to get intubated because um, partly because of like resource allocation, like we don't, you just can't have everybody be intubated. And then partly because 
um, that's just like a lot for the body. And so it's easier to have them stay on these high flow oxygen delivery systems. But I think that seeing people just like gasping for air, like after, I think each time you see it, um, it just feels like kind of more depressing. And I think there probably is an aspect of it where you're thinking like, this was, this was not necessary. Like this, this could have been avoided. And so I think a lot of that has been hard. And I think that contributes a lot to like um, the healthcare providers feeling kind of um, worn down, especially because you're seeing a lot of really young people and it's just very sad. What's the youngest that you, I'm just curious, what's the youngest age that you've seen? I'm trying to, I, I think that I accepted a 29 year old, but you see people in their twenties and thirties and really early on in the pandemic, I had a patient who was a very young, like still working um, six year old who died, you know, in the very first month of the pandemic, one of my colleagues who was in his forties died um, in like March of 2020. And he was, he was like very beloved in the hospital. And so that was, that was like a really gutting period. Um, and, and I mean, at that point I was very concerned that people were just not going to come to work because it was just, there was a lot of fear. It's crazy to think back, but like that, that last period of February and the beginning of March during that period was when a lot of hospitals were telling you not to wear masks because they were trying to conserve masks because we were like going through them really rapidly. And you need those surgical masks for, um, for surgery for like the OR. And so that those first two weeks of March, they were saying like, you shouldn't be wearing masks around the hospital. You know, you should only wear masks when you go in to see a person with pneumonia. And so I thinking back to that time, it's just like, oh, um, and, and a lot of people, you know, people had friends in Northern Italy who were saying you have to wear a mask. Like this is, you can't not wear a mask, but, um, you know, they, they were asking us not to wear masks. There was a lot of like pressure from like the leadership to not, you know, not go around wearing a mask because they didn't have enough. And then, um, you know, after one of our colleagues died, which was like the end of March, um, at that point, they kind of relaxed it and said, you could bring in masks. You know, I had my mom in Texas was offering to like sew masks and send them. So to think about that being like just a year ago is, um, yeah, it's mind boggling. It feels like long and short at the same time. Cause it's like, how could that be a year ago? And already we have three vaccines, you know, more in the pipeline already they're enrolling children who are like, you know, 12 plus it's, um, it's like just breathtaking. It's like taking everything that you're saying. I know. I feel like, I feel like, I mean, how do I even, you know, we've had such a year as just as normal folks. I mean, hearing about does the experiences that a physician has had is it's really sobering and you're our first interview of you know many that we're going to have with physicians so oh my heart feels heavy for you but thank you for all that you do and and um continuing and that you continue to do during this pandemic so we're excited to hear more from you you know we're going to get into a little bit right now um so we're, we're talking about the art that you create and and what inspired you to create this type of artwork I've been making comics now, I mean, my whole life, but um, I started doing a lot of, uh, I started doing some medical comics about five years ago, and then more recently had started doing motherhood comics. And sometimes they overlap and interlock, but um, I think with the pandemic, um, there were kind of two genres that I was doing, which was one was like, especially during the period in New York, and like a year ago, is I think that there was like a lot of, um, you know, it was hard to know what was going on inside of hospitals. Um, and so there was a lot of interest in like what, what exactly the experience was. And so I was writing a little bit about that. I have um, a pretty active mom Instagram about with mom comics and um I feel like it's it's a nice community and it brings me a lot of like sense of community and so I was drawing comics about the pandemic and some of the lighter sides I mostly I think a lot of the comics are more are lighter and um even you know I I drew a comic about how it in like at the end of or in May a bunch of hospitals 
um, in the Northeast in New York City and kind of other places in the Northeast started playing songs when a COVID patient would be discharged because it's kind of this nice way to, um, you know, pay tribute to them. And so at our hospital, they would play Here Comes the Sun over the loudspeaker. And it was nice. And sometimes you'd hear it like, you know, three times in a day. And so I wrote a, a comic about that, about how different hospitals were playing these songs when people got discharged, because it was kind of a nice part of that time. It's brought me a lot of like uh, feeling of community and kind of sharing experiences with other people and uh, a way of kind of memorializing this period. In my work life, there's a lot of interaction and there are so many people at work. You know, I was meeting surgeons who I'd never met before in person because they're always in the OR and they were suddenly like working with me to see these patients. And so that was very different from what I was seeing online that because if you weren't working in a hospital, you were at home, not seeing anyone. And so that um, thinking about like what that experience was like, like in in a lot of ways, I felt very lucky because I was like interacting with lots of people. And there was this sense of like collegiality, um, you know, responding to like this humanitarian crisis. Um, So, um, and then, then also thinking about the ways that like the pandemic kind of stopped time in other ways. Has your artwork always been with comics or have you done any other type of artwork? Um, Well, I love painting and drawing and the comics, um, the comics I like because especially in medicine, if you have a very complex topic, um, comics can be a really uh, engaging way to explore that. So before I started doing the motherhood comics, I was exploring kind of pharmaceutical pricing and, um, um, just more complex um, stories that were easier to convey when you have images um, with the text. And it's also a a more accessible way to storytell, I think. Now with social media and kind of um, the fact that everyone's like looking at their phone all the time, having images um, is like a very powerful way to um, kind of stop people when you're scrolling. So I think that that's also been helpful. You know, when I was starting off on my medical journey, I really wanted to be a physician, but I did not have a sense of what it would look like to be a physician mother. I watched a lot of shows, I guess, and this was pre-Grey's Anatomy. I don't know, maybe Grey's Anatomy has a lot of um, physician moms in it, but um, I didn't really like see a lot of representation of what that looked like. And um, when I was pregnant, a lot of my colleagues said, oh, you'll probably go part-time. And I thought, you know, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be going part-time like financially. I'm not going to do that. And I like to try to draw things that um, reflect like what it's like to do that balancing act, because I don't want people to think like, well, this isn't a feasible career. You know, I want to encourage women to be in medicine and some of the other motherhood artwork that's not medical is mostly meant to like reflect you know, the realities of like motherhood and parenting. And I think it's been interesting because when I started off drawing things, I thought they were very specific to my experience, like weird things that my kids did or annoying things. And now I know from two years of drawing lots of motherhood comics that almost everything is like universal, (laughs) which I never would have known. Um, And even the things that seem so very, you know, individually related to my kids, it's like, no, it's everybody's children. And so that I think, I mean, a lot of motherhood is feeling like very isolated and like you're reinventing the wheel. And so being able to share that and realize that like everyone is dealing with that is, um, yeah, it makes you feel, I think, more supported. And yeah, I, I think mostly I'm interested in exploring motherhood and um, the role of physicians in the culture of medicine. Has some of your recent comics included, um, you know, being a mother um, and in your line of work and then the whole COVID-19 experience as well? Is that all like in in some of your comics as well? I'm just Oh, yeah. Yeah, I wrote... Um, like last year when I hadn't seen the kids for two months, you know, in the Northeast, there's like this time that is very um, striking when like the, you know, all the trees start blooming. And um, I don't know if this is true in California because it's like the seasons are kind of yeah. uh, less discreet than they yeah. are in the Northeast. Um, but in the Northeast, you always see the trees start blooming and then you see all of the different like birds have all their babies. And so like the Canadian geese have their babies. And, um, and so 
I would see like the Canadian geese walking along with their chicks and um, would think about like, you know, my kids and they're not here. And it just felt uh-huh. so weird. So yeah, I, I did have a few comics about um, yeah, them being gone and what that was like. At the beginning, it was like, a, it was kind of nice though. This is like a break. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to fix anyone a snack plate. But yeah, it's, it's nice to have them back. What is your process when you begin an art piece or a comic? Now I mostly like um I keep notes on my phone about like things I want to explore and then think about like how I'm gonna word things in the storytelling. And then once I start drawing it, it may change. Um and I do all of my drawings digitally now, like on the iPad. Um, which is great because it really reduces, um, you know, like just having extra papers everywhere, uh, which we're, if you're a parent, you always have like lots of papers floating around <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, it, now I don't have my drawings floating around. So they're all on digital. What does your art mean to you? Um, for me, it's a great um, kind of daily practice. I, I, I try to draw one cartoon a day, like at the end of the day, which I started doing a few years ago, right after the kids would go to bed. Um, and it's been a really nice way to reflect and also like a, a really powerful form of self-expression for me. I think like a lot of people talk about like, you know, science versus art, but I feel like they're so intertwined and there are so many aspects of my day-to-day job that involve, you know, like cultural things, talking to people, you know, different words. And I don't always get to hear about people's like past jobs and whatnot, but I, you know, I take care of many musicians and in Austin and in New York, there were a lot of like stage artists. And so I don't think that like doing drawing or being interested in different humanities areas, like um, prevents you from having an interest in like um, kind of medicine and diagnosis so I think, I think that they've been very complimentary. There is kind of this paradox because at one side, you know, on one side, it's like exhausting and sad to see all of these cases. And at least at the beginning, it felt very high risk. But then on the other hand, it has been, you know, the ultimate privilege because you're responding to this, like hopefully once in a lifetime crisis, it feels a little bit like the physicians who were, um, you know, treating patients during the AIDS epidemic in the nineties. And so in that way, it's been like a big privilege to be a part of it. So, um, I think that that's always going to be a tension. This first one, love in the time of coronavirus is, I think it's from April of 2020. And I wrote it for a website that I contribute to called cup of Joe, which is a women's lifestyle blog. This was, um, during the time when, you know, it was, right at the beginning of um, everything being conducted over Zoom. I knew a few babies who were born around this time. And so one baby was born like um, around like March 9th and everything was kind of normal. You know, people got to visit um, uh, at the hospital where I was working was a huge birthing center. After that was when you know, one of my colleagues ended up having a baby um, where her, even her husband wasn't allowed to attend the birth. Um, and so she had to kind of conduct all of that over FaceTime and Zoom. Yeah. And so it was thinking about like different ways you were kind of expressing connection and love, like through these different portals. And then also the collegiality of being at work. And I did feel like, I mean, that was, it was such a yeah intense time. And so I think that there were many different times where people would be anxious and you'd be supporting them. And then someone would say, you know, like we're all in this together. And so it was um, a very, very yeah intense time. Uh, yeah. And this is another one, I think from May of 2020. And when we were just thinking about how to start wearing masks and yeah, how you can't like smile at anyone anymore. <laughs> you really have to like smize aggressively. Um, I love the smize. And then her eyes are like, B. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And um, you have to that- wait maniacally, not just yeah. wave, <laughs> but maniacally. <Yeah. laughs> I still think you do. Cause I mean, I'm pretty soft-spoken. So if I say hello, you know, there's a good chance that someone's not hearing me. So you really have to like dial it up with your uh, reactions when you're wearing a mask. 
But this is a big honor. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's a big honor for us to talk to you. This is the first time we do something like this. And um, it, it was great talking to you and, and looking forward to um, the exhibit. But we're really excited for this project. And thank you so much for um, interviewing with us. It's great to meet you guys. Yeah, I look forward to seeing the virtual exhibition. Be great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you All so right. much for joining us. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye.